We got all this green stuff uh, around us right now. I think one of the things that is easy to forget is that without the capacity of plants to capture the energy of the sun, we wouldn't be here right now. Right. Right, these plants are really nature's way of uh, responding to the energy of the sun. So they're taking, uh, they're capturing sunlight in, uh, by photosynthesizing. So this, this is like little solar panels. They're little solar panels. They're just capturing. So why is that so important? I mean, what, like... Because when they capture that sunlight, the thing they do, the thing that they've evolved to do is capture that sunlight and take the energy from that sunlight and take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So like a gas, like a these gas. little molecules that are just like tiny things. The gas little thing. passively uh, moves across little tiny holes in the leaves called stomates. The gas gets inside the leaves. The plant then takes that gas and connects it to some other carbon molecules inside the leaf. Like little Legos. Builds these chains, like yeah. little Legos. Yeah. And when it does that, it's basically building energy. You know, it's making energy and chemical bonds in those carbon bonds. So those carbon to carbon bonds that are linked together is like a little little battery almost, like a little energy right. storage. Right. And it's using that energy of the sun to create that link. Right. And then yeah. it takes that link, that six carbon chain that it's made, because what it does is it takes the one carbon dioxide atom uh, molecule and breaks that down, uh, links it onto a five carbon at, uh, uh, molecule that's in the plant already. And then it breaks those apart and starts to build sugars. And it uses those sugars, it, just like you and I use sugar this morning in our coffee, we use that sugar for energy. It, it stimulates us, it helps us build our biomass, it helps us have so, energy. So we take the energy that's locked, that the plants have painstakingly grabbed from the sun, put into these chemical bonds there, and we take it and break it down right. and release that energy, and that's what allows us to do what we do. Right. Keep al stay alive, to grow, to maintain our machinery uh, kind of going. So we can't do this. We can't right. capture the sun's energy. Unless we want to figure out a way to attach solar panels to our bodies and figure out a way to do that, which, you know, maybe that's a good idea. But uh, unless we want to do that, we have to rely on plants harvesting so that sun's energy, taking that carbon dioxide. Now, critically, when they do that, they also need water and they also need nutrients. Nitrogen is the primary nutrient, but others, mm -hmm. phosphorus, yep. uh, potassium, uh, etc. Yeah. So they have to get these nutrients, usually from the soil. They have to get that water, usually from the soil. They combine it with that CO2 gas from the atmosphere and that uh, energy from the, uh, from the sun, and they build their biomass. And so we call these primary producers because they are the, the first line, if you will, of capturing the sun's energy and building life. All the other life is is based on what these plants so can do. So we, if these are producers, we're consumers. That's it, to, for us to stay alive, we are entirely dependent right. on these plants right. to actually capture that, that sun for right. So in the, in the technical lingo, these are autotrophs and we're heterotrophs. Right, they're autotrophic because they can uh, get their carbon on their own, so to speak. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> We're heterotrophic because we have to get the carbon that they've gotten for us. From them. Uh, and, you know, it's not just us. It's every other critter you can think of. It's a critter in the soil. It's bacteria in the soil. It's lions and tigers. And it was mastodons before us. And so if it wasn't for all this green stuff, this little solar panels, there wouldn't be really the, right. the higher life on Earth that right. we see right now. All right, so let's find out a little bit about plants and what keeps them ticking, what we actually, what they need in order to keep this whole thing uh, going. So it sounds easy enough. You've got these plants, they've got their little solar panels out there. They do this magical thing, photosynthesis, capturing the sun's energy, putting those carbon molecules together. It sounds easy, but it's actually pretty challenging to be a plant. As we mentioned before, in order to uh, uh, use their machinery, their photosynthetic machinery, they have to have water. Uh, water is part of the uh, electron transport chain that allows them to take that energy and, and turn that carbon into stored energy. And, uh, and so um, you have to have water. And of course, mostly that comes from the soil, but originally it comes down in precipitation. And uh, you have to have nitrogen. Nitrogen is a key part of building proteins. Uh, and those proteins are the things that um, 
that uh, chlorophyll and other types of uh, uh, parts of uh, photosynthesis are made of. Proteins are like the little engines that do all the work, actually, of putting that, of capturing the sun's energy, of actually putting these molecules together. Everything happens with these little machines, these little molecular machines that are proteins. And the main backbone of these is nitrogen. And that's why nitrogen is so important. Yeah. Without that, we're, you can't create those little engines. In right, here. and so there are a whole bunch of other nutrients that are important for that too. But nitrogen tends to be the one that's most limiting. And this yeah. idea, this concept of a limiting uh, resource is critical here. Mm -hmm. uh, nitrogen is often limiting, especially in temperate regions, which are, uh, you know, not the tropics, but mm -hmm. places farther north and farther south on the globe. And that's because the soils here are quite young uh, in relative terms, and so they haven't had a time to build up much nitrogen in relative, you know, geologic terms. So the so other the other reason is that nitrogen is very squishy and hard to nail down in the environment. Uh, nitrogen has a whole bunch of different valence states which allows it to be a gas, it allows it to be a solid, it allows it to be aqueous, all within a pretty narrow temperature range, uh -huh. which means it's kind of, it's kind of squishy. Changing it's all the time. It's changing yeah. all the time. It's uh -huh. going from an aqueous state in the soil, getting taken up by a plant, it's being denitrified and sent off to the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So it's really, I, I say squishy, it's like, it's like you're trying to- It's hard to it pin down. down. It's hard to pin yeah, down. Yeah, yeah. So it often is a limiting nutrient. And where are they getting those, that from the, where in the environment are plants going to be getting that from? Well, this plant, which is a grass plant, uh, is taking up its nitrogen and its water from its roots here. And so this is a very shallow root system. I think it probably broke off some yeah, of it. Probably. It might have been a little deeper. But this particular grass plant doesn't have a very uh, deep rooting system. But these roots are constantly growing and exploring the soil, looking for water and nitrogen. And they're, they're looking for those things as they're limiting. And so if you have not very much water, but a lot of nitrogen, they're looking for water. Vice versa, if you have a lot of water and not very much nitrogen, they're looking for nitrogen. And again, I'm using nitrogen as sort of shorthand for nutrients because other nutrients can be limiting, but it tends to be nitrogen in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, what other tricks do plants have to actually get that nitrogen? One of the things that some plants have done, like this plant, for example, we can dig it out of here. Is, an mm -hmm. is that an alfalfa plant? Yeah, Somewhere in there. <laughs> yeah. That's an alfalfa plant, part of an alfalfa plant. We didn't get its roots, but it's a legume. Claudio's going to find this one here. Oh, God, it's in the concrete. It's got a deep root. Uh, it's, it's got a deep tap root, so it can be hard to pull out. I have my knife here, too. Uh, oh, well done, Claudio. Thank you. Patience. So here's an alfalfa plant. An alfalfa plant is a legume. Oh, beautiful. Right oh, here. look at that. Yeah. So legumes are a family of plant, the leguminosae, also known now as the Fabaceae, that have developed a symbiotic relationship with bacterium, uh, rhizobia, that um, take nitrogen out of the atmosphere. The rhizobia themselves. Like a gas, like take nitrogen the gas. Nitrogen gas out of yeah. the atmosphere. 78% of our atmosphere is nitrogen gas, but it's dinitrogen, and it's very hard to break that dinitrogen molecule apart, but these rhizobia have enzymes and capability internally to do that. Can you get in here close, Cam, and see these little nodules here, these little white nodules? Yeah. They grow on the roots, these they infect dots. the roots, they inoculate the roots, and they, provide nitrogen then, not only to themselves, but to the alfalfa plant. So this alfalfa plant has entered into this symbiotic relationship with these bacteria to help it alleviate its nitrogen resource limitation. And so that's one of the reasons that alfalfa is such a great agronomic plant, but there are any number of other legumes that we use in an agronomic way. We use um, clovers and mm -hmm. pastures and that sort of thing, and in hay mm -hmm. fields. Peanuts are legumes. Mm -hmm. uh, help me out with some other legumes here, Claudio, off the top of your head. Beans of all kinds. Beans of yeah. all kinds, yeah. Soybeans are so an example. all of these yep. plants are examples that have this, yep. this um, mm -hmm. symbiotic relationship. And because of that, because they can capture all that nitrogen, that means the tissues up here yeah. of the plants actually have a lot more nitrogen than something like this, too. Right, 
Right. Yeah. The, the carbon to nitrogen ratio of the leaf tissues and of the stem tissues is much lower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, we, you might think of it as juicier. Yeah. Um, whereas this corn plant has a pretty high carbon to nitrogen ratio. It builds mm -hmm. a lot of carbon biomass for mm -hmm. each unit of nitrogen it takes mm -hmm. up. This corn can't do this symbiotic fixation mm -hmm. for nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons corn gets a lot of nitrogen applied to it. So we have to add corn, add nitrogen to this so that they can actually build their tissues. These get it from their symbiotic relationship yeah. there. Yeah, that's really cool. So yeah. often these plants are phosphorus limited because they have alleviated their own nitrogen limitation and they become limited by other resources. Yeah, very cool. So that also makes it a good plant to have in rotation, and that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons that it's such a useful agronomic plant in this part of the world is that we often rotate alfalfa and corn together because they go after different resources, because they have different limiting factors, mm -hmm. and by mixing it up, we're sort of getting the most out of the soil, so to speak. So we got nitrogen limitation or nutrient limitation, which is key. We talked a little bit about water limitation, and we're going to talk a lot more about that uh, later on. Um, and uh, what other kind of limitation do we have? I mean, carbon dioxide is everywhere. Carbon so, dioxide is everywhere. Because that is ultimately how you build the carbon molecules, right. you know, through absorption. Right. What else, uh, what else do we need to worry about? <laughs> well, one of the, the four key limiting factors for plants are water, nutrients, light. Ah, okay. And space. And so when we talk about light, you can imagine that this corn plant if these grass weeds that are growing around it got too tall, they would start competing with this corn plant for light. They create I mean, shade, basically. They're shading right out this, yeah. this, this plant's ab ability to do photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so they're crowding it for, uh, for light. And then they're also crowding it for space. So um, if this corn plant were going to do any sort of growth out into space, it would be impeded by the limitation that the... Uh, the undesirable plant, the grass plant, is, is having that. And what you mean by that is the roots moving out and trying to get that water and well, nitrogen? I was talking or? more about these leaves that you can see are already ah, starting to die and suggest, okay. probably because they're, they don't have anywhere to go and they don't have anywhere to grow. So the plant is actually allocating more of its resources up. Higher up, high. higher up. Yeah, no, no use having a bunch of solar panels down here if they're right. not capturing any light. Yeah, that's good. So that's resource limitation. Right on. So, um, so we talked about the limiting nutrients that, uh, the limiting resources more broadly, not just nutrients, but also light, also water, nitrogen, space. phosphorus, space. So these plants have to make, and I say have to make, these plants are genetically programmed basically to decide to make, um, it's not decide, what's the word I want to use? These plants are basically genetically programmed to use uh, to build po body parts so that they can actually take advantage of yeah. those limiting nutrients, scavenging for them. Well, like I talked about with the roots before, they're responding to these limitations. Right. And so you can imagine when you see a cornfield like this that's growing so tall, it's responding to the fact that light is probably the most limiting factor for it. Because the farmer has alleviated nutrient and water stress well, we live in a place where it rains a lot, so water stress isn't really a Not big a issue. Um, and they usually alleviate nitrogen stress in corn in this part of the world by adding nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And so the plants are growing very tall to outcompete each other mm. because this corn plant does compete with this corn plant, mm -hmm. intra-specific competition. So they're growing as tall as they can uh, to try and get light, which is a limiting resource. So they're mm. allocating the carbon energy mm. that they take up they're allocating it above ground, so to speak. They're, al they're uh, allocating it to growing tall. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, if, if nitrogen is really the limiting factor, they're not going to allocate as much above ground. They're going to allocate more below ground looking for that nitrogen. And in fact, that's probably what's happened here. I don't know if you can see behind Claudio Cam, but the plants over there that are corn are very dark green. Mm -hmm. Those plants uh, do not have nitrogen limitation. These yellowish ones that we're standing in front of probably do have nitrogen limitation, and so they're gr growing not as tall. I would guess that their root systems are probably deeper and more extensive because they're trying to find that nitrogen. So they're allocating the energy they take below ground, trying to... So, so to anthropomorphize to it. it a little bit, they're basically making decisions about 
what can I do as, as an individual plant here, what can I do to maximize that resource capture? Right. In this situation where I'm in, I'm missing nitrogen, I need to allocate my energy to go getting more of that nitrogen. Yeah. And it's not a decision. Yeah. It's just it's a, a hormonal response right. to like, I better, I better find some nitrogen or I'm not going to survive. It's just a machinery. It's like right. a, it's an if then statement in right. a computer program yeah. almost like <laughs> if oh, you have water, we're grow good. Up. If you have nitrogen, grow up. If you don't grow down. That's right. So, yeah. Know, there's no conscious decision. There it's no like decisions. they're, yeah, they're programmed to, they're to responding to their environment and it's not yeah. just below ground. They're also responding to cues from their neighbors. Mm -hmm. The amount of light that's reflected back and forth mm -hmm. between these leaves we now know yeah uh, they're sensing that so they know that they're being crowded or mm -hmm. not and so that helps that cues them to grow mm -hmm. taller and skinnier with yeah. fewer leaves mm -hmm. and all these are important allocation strategies that different that plants have in different ways you know some some plants allocate more energy above ground sort of uh, from as a starting point some uh, allocate more below ground as a starting point and one of the key things we've done in agriculture is uh, through plant breeding and genetic modification and all the many ways that we push plants we're pushing plants to allocate their resources in different ways and so one of the key things that we've done with corn plants over the years and by we I'm saying for thousands and thousands of years we selected corn plants that um, produce a very big <coughs> fruiting body and that fruiting body is the corn. Um, this is the fruit of the corn, the grain, which is in here somewhere. You all know what a ear of corn looks like. But we've pushed this plant to put as much energy as it can into this body, but still stay alive overall, because that's the trade-off. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I can make a huge, huge ear of corn, but if I don't allocate enough resources to finding nitrogen and water, I'm gonna be dead. If I don't allocate enough resources, carbon, uh, to the above ground part of the plant to photosynthesize, I'm going to get out competed and die. But the farmer, the agronomist, wants to push the plant to grow as much of this reproductive uh, part of the plant as possible. And so the plant can only allocate its carbon, and it's a zero sum game at some level. Uh, they can only allocate that carbon as, in, in as many ways as. So they it's like, uh, it's like you, you come home from your job and you got a $100 paycheck and you got to do something with that. What do you do with it? Well, you could. Use it to I know eat. what I would do with it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you got to save a little bit to pay the rent. You got to actually save some to make it to your job the next day. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to work. But you also want to have some fun, you know. So it's in the end, you only have so much carbon to go around. And the, the, the allocation to leaves means you're not going to be allocating to that. Vice versa. You allocate too much to that. Maybe you're not going to grow as tall and you might get outcompeted by, by your neighbor. So this is the idea of trade-offs. There's only so much energy, there's only so much carbon to go around, and how do you actually, how can you be the most competitive and the most successful in the world while balancing those trade-offs?